if, if they would provide us with health care nationally as opposed to health insurance, I think we would be going in the right direction. But for sure you can't even leave your job, even though you feel sick enough to want to, because you will lose your insurance. There should be no connection between job and insurance. No single citizen of any of these countries have the insecurity of health, the insecurity of changing job, the insecurity of a catastrophic illness, the insecurity of being needing treatment at some period of time and not having it because of financial inability. It's as illogical to pay an insurance industry to handle your health care money for you as it would be to pay them to handle your car repairs. The difference being that car repairs are not often as urgent. The establishment media are pretty much ignoring the single-payer solution to the health problem in the United States. But we're going to emphasize that right now on Alternative Views. which show that the most popular health care system in the minds of the American people is the single-payer system, such as they have in Canada. And yet this is not the Clinton plan, it is not the Republican plan. And the media, for the most part, are ignoring it. We'll show you a documentary about this later, but right now, let's present to you some news stories which we've acquired from the alternative press. Nicaragua seems almost on the verge of collapse. The United States has done nothing to help the country, as it promised, after the election of Chamorro, and the Sandinistas were pushed out of office, even though they still, with 40% of the uh, votes, were the largest uh, group, the most effective group, and the one that was needed to help run the country. But the Sandinistas still maintain control of the army. And the U.S. said, no, that's got to go. But Chamorro knew that there was no other force that could be used to do this. Well, however, even though Chamorro did not get rid of the Sandinista-controlled army, she did impose austerity measures that was demanded by the United States and the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. These austerity measures hit hard, of course, at the public sector and at the agricultural sector. And as a result, Managua was paralyzed by a general strike. The revolution had awakened popular and class uh, uh, consciousness that, uh, during the revolution, and so it didn't take too much to get them uh, upset. But now the Sandinista party leadership had not called for a general strike. And However, for the austerity program, some of the Sandinistas are now supporting this. So the Sandinistas are kind of being torn apart by internal strife. Some supporting austerity, some are not. And even within the army, when this general strike occurred, the uh, army generally stood aside and didn't do anything to break up the demonstrations or to repress uh, the, them as they were paralyzing uh, traffic. But as time has gone on, the uh, head of the government has started to clamp down more, and particularly Humberto Ortega, who is head of the government and uh, uh, the uh, brother of Daniel Ortega, who is head of the Sandinistas, uh, he started to clamp down not only on Sandinistas, but also on right-wingers. They've even set up a uh, internal security system, which kind of functioning kind of like death squads, and they're clamping down on the far right. 
So the whole situation in the country is in turmoil. The economic is a, uh, econ economy of the country is in a mess. It's a dangerous place to be in now, whereas it used to be the safest in the in the hemisphere. The economy is, is in terrible shape, whereas under the Sandinistas, before the U.S. Uh, set the counters down there to destroy the revolution, the economy was growing at a rate faster than any other country in the whole Western Hemisphere. And But things are are really very, very difficult for the whole population. In this article uh, put out by the NACLA, they indicate that we have to remember that Nicaragua is only part of Central America, and the same forces uh, creating social instability and upheaval are also in effect in El Salvador and in Guatemala, and even in, in uh, stable Costa Rica, austerity measures are, have created such a bad situation there economically that uh, there is starting to be popular resistance and clamped down by the uh, government forces. Rush Limbaugh has recently been named the winner of Propaganda Review's first ever Propagandist of the Year Award. Limbaugh's method of spouting off about important issues like the environment and civil and human rights of minorities under the guise of being just an entertainer landed him the dubious recognition. According to the magazine, Limbaugh's methods allow him to be a propagandist for pro-corporate, racist, and anti-feminist values and positions in often mean-spirited ways without being subjected to normal criticism and debate. Furthermore, his arrogant posturing and outrageously right-wing positions are so obnoxious to most Americans to the left of center that no one bothers to monitor what he is saying. Figure in the millions of people who watch Limbaugh's popular half-hour TV program, the people who turn into his three-hour radio program daily, or who have read his book, The Way Things Ought to Be, and the chubby liberal basher can become quite dangerous. Propaganda Review blames the mainstream news media for much of the Limbaugh phenomena. If Limbaugh had been examined critically at the start of his national career, perhaps enough people would have seen through his style and rejected his substance, which basically has made being a bigoted racist and narrow-minded fool acceptable <laughs> for many Americans. Limbaugh's response to such criticism? A bigot is someone who wins an argument with a liberal. It always amazes me about Americans. Uh, you know, people will, you know, think that uh, uh, Richard Nixon was great, but if they live next door to him, they'd know he'd be this morose, unhappy, unpalatable, paranoid, nobody have anything to do with, you know, a crook type. Uh, if they live next door to uh, Ronald Reagan, they say, oh, he's kind of nice, but he's kind of a fool, he's a fuddy-duddy, he can't remember anything, he has trouble keeping in touch with the reality. If they lived next door to Russ Limbaugh, they wouldn't have a thing to do with him. He, you know, such an egotistical gas bag, you know, you wouldn't have him in your house, or, you, you know, you'd make sure that that uh, any time you were outside of the yard, the same time he was next door in his, you'd have your lawnmower on so you wouldn't uh, have to listen or to him. Or squirt him with the water hose. That's what <laughs> yeah. But it's absurd. But just because people are on television or in some public office, they think, oh, my, there's a fine, fine person, or, oh, he's smart. But I tell you, yeah, we're good examples. You don't have to be smart to be on television. I tell you that right now, folks. Racial bias in mainstream media. A January publication of Extra has an interesting article on this issue. Mentioned is an op-ed of the New York Post from November of 92, which worried that 25% of African-American New Yorkers relied on, quote, militant black weeklies for their news, not on the mainstream, mainstream media whose perspective can counter these extremist views. The article in Extra worries about militant white dailies such as the New York Post, which ran an editorial called Target Suburban Women, opposite this op-ed. Trying to stir up racial fears and tensions, the editorial commented on gruesome and depraved crimes against middle-class people and how crimes in the suburbs have reached epidemic proportions. Suburban, as used by the New York Post, is a barely veiled code word for white. The paper went out of its way to mention that the suspect, suspected killer was wearing an X sweatshirt and that similar crimes often have racial implications. Although the media presents crime as being at a new height, the number of victims of violent crime has actually decreased by 9% since 1981. 
The most common victims are black men, who are 50% more likely than white men and two and a half times more likely than white women to be the victim of violent crime. And does crime always have what the Post called racial implications? Well, only 18% of white victims of violent crime report that their assailant was black. Maybe the real racial bias is against African Americans. Blacks account for 29% of arrests, but 47% of inmates. But if all you read was the New York Post, you wouldn't know that. I hope by now you've seen the statistics on the violence toward women in the United States. The FBI says that a battering incident occurs every 18 seconds in the United States, and 30% of all female homicides are killed by their husbands and boyfriends. In October of 1992, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee found that at least 1.1 million assaults against women in the home were reported in that year, in year 1991. And by some estimates, there's many as 3 million more of these crimes go unreported. But one of the big days for crimes happens to occur when there's a big day for men. That big day is the Super Bowl. It's one of the worst days of the year for violence toward women, and some women's shelters actually have to put on extra staff during that day because they know they will be having more uh, uh, help required for people, women who are being battered. Why is this? Well, the Super Bowl is, uh, well, football's a violent sport, and the Super Bowl seems to trigger a lot of the violence uh, that are, is uh, in men, and because, well, they, uh, the viewing of the game is very intense, men are drinking frequently and betting, and then, of course, their team loses, well, then the poor woman is the one who uh, uh, suffers the consequences. There was a study made in 1990 which showed that in the relationship to battering and women that 25% of the men seeking counseling for battering women had been violent after viewing sports. Carrizo, which is a maquiladora in the Piedras Negras area, is one of the three apparel manufacturing factories that is owned by the Salent Corporation Company of, of New York. Now, in this particular plant, there are no extractors, so fibers from the fur that is worked on there fill the, the air of the plant. A young man who worked there for five years and was in perfect health condition when he began working there became infected in one of his lungs during his third year of working in the factory. He did receive sick leave for work-related illness for the first leave that he did request. However, during the past two years, he was on leave repeatedly due to the same illness and was not granted work-related sick leave. This means that he only received half of his pay. Now, his doctors repeatedly recommended that he be placed in an area of the factory where he would not be exposed to this fur. But since the entire factory was a fur factory, this was impossible. On October 8th, he was scheduled for an operation in Monterey for his lungs. But by this time, both of his lungs were severely infected from the factory environment. The man died in Monterey, and the cause of his death is still unknown. We'll have more news later. But now let's see our documentary about health care in the United States and the best form of it. Let's see a documentary called Healing America. It's eating people alive, and this just can't continue. I went through the nightmare that millions of people like myself go through, and this has got to be changed. We have people who are avoiding treatment because they can't afford insurance or they can't afford health care, which is what we really want is health care, not health insurance. If, if they would provide us with health care nationally as opposed to health insurance, I think we would be going in the right direction. For every American, health care is their right. I don't think there is any doubt that the American people do want fundamental health care reform. Band-aid approaches to health care will not solve the problem. It's only going to get worse. Hello, I'm John Wilson. The program you're about to see could very well save your life, or at least improve the quality of your life, in a country where health care has become a national crisis, disrupting the peace of mind and the lives of far too many Americans. This volunteer-produced video endorses no political party or candidate. 
It is the product of a growing grassroots movement dedicated to bringing the United States into line with the rest of the industrialized world. A world that accepts health care as a human right and a national responsibility. Join us now as we take a hard look at some of the devastating effects of the medical insurance industry in America. What is important here will be the practical solution we offer, one that is fair, affordable, and has a proven record of performance. It's known around the world as the single-payer system of universal health care. More and more Americans from all walks of life are supporting the single-payer plan as they discover that it's the only plan that will reduce costs and at the same time maintain the high quality of health care that Americans have come to expect from our medical system. First, let's meet some people who have agreed to share their medical stories. They could easily be your neighbors, your friends, your family. The only difference, perhaps, is that they place their trust in today's health care industry only to find themselves living the nightmare of an insurance system that abandoned them. These are their stories. They could one day be yours. I gave birth to a son 18 years ago, and uh, he was born with a cleft lip and palate. He's had 26 operations to correct the cleft lip and palate. He had, uh, he developed epilepsy later on, and uh, scoliosis, heart murmur, diagnosed with those. Nothing life-threatening but long-term care. About five years ago, when he was 13, he was hospitalized for two months. After the first month, the hospital demanded payment of my share, what the insurance wouldn't cover, $20,000. I had a good job, but when the company sold out and left town, I couldn't keep up the payments. I had to sell my home at a loss. As I started looking for options then to continue the health care, I found out that because he had been diagnosed with epilepsy, he was ineligible for private insurance. He has now been seizure free for three years and off medication. Private insurance companies will still not cover him, ever because he once had epilepsy. If I find another job, the group insurance policies, almost without fail, have a one to two year waiting period before they will cover for pre-existing conditions. And at the end of that time, because of his age, he'd be too old to qualify for dependent coverage. He's a very, very gifted musician, but he is hearing disabled. He um, needs further surgery to help improve his hearing. They can't correct it. We have to find ways to pay for it. In the last 12 months, his medical bills have mounted to over $20,000. Without some kind of health insurance to cover people like this with long-term care problems and catastrophic care problems, I just don't see a way to do it. I lost my home and my life savings while I had a job and insurance. Our family has benefited greatly from having a very good medical system in this country. Um, our son was born with some breathing problems and uh, urinary problems, which if we had not had a very sophisticated medical system in the United States, he would not be alive today. Uh, the problem that we have had recently, or over the last three years, has been that because of the type of group plan our insurance was under, our rates continue to rise because of both my son's illness and an illness that I had. Um, between the two of us, uh, our insurance went to over $900 a month. Now we are faced with um, dialysis and transplant in the near future, and our policy, or at this point David's policy, is very limited in what it will cover, particularly with transplant. Fortunately, with our system, Medicare does cover 
transplants, but only covers for drug therapy one year after transplant. So the very thing that keeps a person alive after transplant, which is the drug therapy, is then cut out after one year as of today. Um, I guess as a middle class person and having worked for any number of years, both Steve and myself, um, I found it very frustrating when our insurance premiums got un unpayable for us that I began to research through the social system that our country has in place and Medicaid would be able to help us out if we made under $13,000 a year. Well, we make more than $13,000 a year and so we could not avail ourselves of that coverage. And I think that if we did go on Medicaid, we would have something like a $2,700 a month deductible was what they told us. And I talked to the lady and I said, well, gee, that's really undoable for us. And I asked her if she had any other suggestions of what we might do. And her comment to me was, well, have you ever thought of moving to another country, a country that has um, health care provided? And that was a slap in the face to me since both Steve and I have um, bought into the American system, gotten a good education, uh, tried to have decent jobs, and found out that our social system does not cover us for um, a catastrophic illness. A couple of years ago, I was just like you all. I was working um, most of the time two jobs. I found out almost by accident that I had a very real problem. Three days after I found out, I had a quote suspicious mass, which they knew right away because I was a textbook classic. Um, I was in shock, naturally, and in denial, and, um, but I had the presence of mind to at least ask for a second opinion. And I was, I was treated so incredibly bad by my physician um, because I had the audacity to request to see an oncologist that he called me at work and said, you're causing too much trouble and you're not moving fast enough you're becoming a legal liability to me, legal liability, for not moving fast enough. And, um, and we have asked people to leave our insurance plan for less than this. And I know now, in retrospect, that it was all because of money and insurance reasons. You see, you're, you can't leave your job because you can't have your insurance to have your illness for with. <laughs> Uh, you can't even go to another job, but for sure you can't even leave your job even though you feel sick enough to want to because you will lose your insurance. There should be no connection between job and insurance. I'm sure this helped cause my downfall. It is almost impossible to go through chemo and work. And a lot of people do it, but a lot of people shouldn't have to do it. And that's why I want to say this, because it's got to get better, and it has to change. These are tragic stories, indeed, but the real tragedy lies in the fact that they are heard far too often in this great nation of ours. So what are the alternatives for these people and for the millions of uninsured and underinsured Americans? What are your alternatives? Most of us are ready for change, but it must be change that makes a real difference, that goes beyond hit or miss health care coverage. For to do nothing, or simply to patch the present system, can only dim long-term prospects for bringing quality care to all Americans. Many experts familiar with the crisis in health care strongly support a single-payer plan. Let's listen now to some of them explain why we need single-payer and how it would work to prevent these and other health care insurance disasters from happening ever again in America. <laughs> Director of the Florida Public Health Information Center and Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management is Dr. Jay Wolfson. 
We spend an awful lot of money in both the public and the private sectors on helping to finance administrative related costs that have nothing to do with the provision of health care services to people. And it's not the fault of the providers, it's not the fault of the hospitals, it's not the fault of the physicians. It's not necessarily even the fault of the government. It's a system we've kind of fallen into because in the early days of health benefits and health insurance, nobody was interested in nor willing to provide that function. And the insurance industry stepped in naturally. Well now as a society, both public and private sectors, we have to ask ourselves some very probing questions. Do we need the insurance industry to provide us with health care services? Do we need the insurance industry to provide us with access to health care services? I think not. I think we've become sophisticated enough technologically. We have enough information about costs and prices and needs of populations, and we certainly can learn more, that if we abandoned the multiplicity of dozens and dozens of fiscal intermediaries pretending to help us receive health care benefits and instead structured a system where the money we currently spend on health care in both public and private sectors is pooled and a guaranteed minimum level of benefits may be provided that allows for a lot of things for one thing it helps hospitals and other health care pro providers to reduce those reduce those incredible administrative costs that they're currently spending now and that money can be then channeled toward care, toward services, toward technology. And that's very important. Well, it seems that some people are thinking that the single pay system is socialized medicine. Can you comment on that? Now, there's a, a real misunderstanding among many Americans about what a single payer system might involve. Many Americans believe that people are talking about a socialized health insurance system. But I don't think that's accurate. When we talk about a socialized health insurance system, we're really talking about ownership of the means of production by the state. And that means that the physicians, the hospitals, the nurses, the dentists, the clinics, the pharmaceutical companies would literally be owned and employed by the government. That's the case in some countries. That is not what the single-payer system suggests. Rather, it suggests that all providers of health care services be paid from a single or a unified source of payment. That all of the money that's currently being diverted to hundreds and hundreds of various third-party middle people organizations be pooled, either regionally or at the state level, or perhaps even nationally, and that the reimbursement to providers, to physicians, to hospitals, to nurses, to dentists, and for other health care services, be established on a uniform fee schedule basis. Now, we've been heading this way with national government policy. We have come to recognize that health is a very valuable commodity in our country, not just because people need it, but because health has really become our most valuable asset in our community. As I've studied other nations, particularly Japan, I've come to realize that both the private and public sectors value the health of their citizens and their employees because a healthy employee, a healthy citizen, is a productive employee and the productive citizen. And that's one of the places I believe we may have fallen behind, but I don't believe it's too late to catch up. And if we focus on ensuring, not insuring, but ensuring and assuring access to quality health care services for people with an emphasis on promotion and wellness and reasonable cost, we can significantly reduce the cost of administering our current health care system with a single payer program. Use of the emergency room that we discussed. Dr. Mark Yacht is public health unit director in Pasco County, Florida. Care. It is e extremely important that we make the system efficient. A one-payer system, in my opinion, would be ideal if you had... You, right now, we face 1,500 insurers nationally writing different kinds of plans. We have some 900 doing that in Florida. And there are different billing processes. There are, there are committees that look at billing. There are different uh, uh, mechanisms to, for physicians and other health providers to get reimbursed. This all adds enormously to the cost of health care. How serious an issue is this lack of access to medical care in the United States, Dr. Yacht? Understand that 37 million Americans have no health insurance. 
That means health care comes out of their pocket. Another 25 million to 30 million are underinsured. In the state of Florida, some 2.5 million Floridians have no health insurance. That truly is uh, a quality of life issue for America. We, we need to have an ability to get good medical care. It affects our ability to work. It affects children's ability to be educated in our school system. Uh, it is a, in my opinion, a cornerstone relating to quality of life and, it, and is as important as dealing with crime or other social issues. We need to get health care out to people. It is our system for our health. We pay for it, and we have the right to design it. Dr. Samir Banub specializes in the study of international health care programs at the University of South Florida's College of Public Health. He is an active member in the Physicians for a National Health Care Plan. Many Americans are afraid that the cost of health care reform will mean higher taxes. Well, the fear about taxations and more taxation, more expenses, I, I think there are some efforts by those who are lobbying in the system and those who are trying to defeat any uh, uh, radical reform in it is to raise phobias around the coast. Well, let's see. Without any interference, the coast is going up 15% a year. And it will be unaffordable to the whole community and to the whole country. Without reform and change, people are paying more out of pocket. So if you pay, if your premiums are increasing, the amount that you pay before the insurance kicks in, that is the deductibles, the co-payment, every time you go, you pay part of the bill. Aren't these real taxes? Aren't these real expenses? So if the system is being designed it should save costs. Whether you pay it in one way or the other, this goes out of your pocket. In fact, the employers, when they pay for your health care system, this is part of your wage. These are fringe benefits. This is money that you ought to receive. Uh, most European countries have their own problems. Some problems which are common, but nobody has our problems, of course. But none of them no single citizen of any of these countries have the insecurity of health, the insecurity of changing job, the insecurity of a catastrophic illness, the insecurity of being needing treatment at some period of time and not having it because of financial inability, because you're simply unable to pay. So this is the difference. I mean, the mere security of health care is the issue. Martin Dykman, associate editor of the St. Petersburg Times, has studied all sides of the health care debate. He favors the single-payer plan with the objectivity of a journalist. Problem with uh, complicated reform, and this is what worries me perhaps the most about managed competition, is that it perpetuates the need for a very large bureaucracy and bureaucracies are what waste money in health care I like I want the money we spend to be going to the people in the front line the nurses the doctors the paramedics the people who hold your lives in your hands the, your, the, the laboratory technicians I don't want it siphoned off by people who are making a commission for selling me an insurance policy I don't want it siphoned off for people whose job is to determine whether I fit in this policy or that policy or whether I pay a twenty dollar deductible or a thirty deductible or this or that I want it to go for care I, somebody else pointed out it, it's as illogical to pay an insurance industry to handle your health care money for you as it would be to pay them to handle your car repairs. The difference being that car repairs are not often as urgent. Again, as with cars with people, the longer you postpone it, the worse it gets. I think the Clinton's, Clinton administration is talking about simplifying the bureaucracy, about having standard claim, claim forms about uh, universal coverage where you could not be turned down for a policy because somebody in the company is, is, is has poor health. All this is fine, but I still think the whole purpose 
of the political compromise represented by managed competition is to preserve a place for the insurance industry. I'm sorry, I don't see the necessity for that place. What do you think would have to happen in order to enact a single pay universal health care system in this country? What's it going to take to get a single payer system? Well, one of two things. It's going to take Congress refusing, under the influence of the lobbies, to pass a decent version of the President's bill, in which case he should re re refuse to sign a brutalized, watered down, and uh, meaningless version. Or it would take a passage of a bill that subsequently fails to contain health care costs and fails to satisfy the American people that their needs are being met. In that case, you might very well get the political revolution. I've had a doctor who is a legislator tell me that managed competition is the last best hope to prevent a single-payer plan. Well, I'd rather look at it another way. I look upon it as the last gasp of the traditional establishment. If it works, fine. I, as I said, I'm skeptical. And if it doesn't work, then the people of the United States have got to get pretty mad and pretty angry and do, I would imagine, politically desperate things in order to get the political establishment finally to listen. And then we're at a crossroads in American history. I think everybody knows that what we've had can't continue. A lot of people are skeptical about whether we can do anything to make it better. We're about to find out. And I, this, and this is an urgent issue that all of us should pay close attention to. Each of these experts on health care has presented the facts favoring a single-payer plan from his own unique perspective. What all agree on, however, is that no plan can hope to succeed without the support of the community. Of citizens like you, who are ready for real change. We'd like you now to meet a group of these health care citizen advocates. They speak for themselves and for hundreds of organizations nationwide that endorse the single-payer plan of universal health care. Hi, my name is Dick Holmes. I hope what you've heard thus far has inspired you to support the single-payer health care system. A lot of us feel real strongly about that, and I'd like to ask Lee to lead off here and tell us, Lee, why do we need the single-payer system? Well, my name is Lee Moise, and I'm with the Florida Health Care Campaign and also with UCAN. And UCAN represents 42 states. We're all after a single-payer system. We believe that health care is a right, not a privilege. And we believe that everybody should have health care. We are the only industrialized nation in the world that does not have health care for all their people. We have to take health care out of the insurance company's hands and put it to the people. We need a single-payer system. We sure do. And we have others that share that enthusiasm. We have a registered nurse with us here. And why do we need the single-payer system? Dick, I'm Beverly Carpenter Mason, as you said, a registered nurse and a health care quality assurance professional. And I'm concerned about access to health care for all Americans, children, middle-aged, and elderly. And I'm also concerned about the quality of that health care. And I feel strongly that the single-payer system will facilitate equality in health care. We all agree with that. Jim, would you add something to that? Uh, the most important thing that I can add is that it's absolutely critical that health care uh, coverage is no longer predicated on your place of employment or on your spouse. I recently lost my dad. My mother then lost her health insurance because he had insurance through his place of employment. So it's critical that health care is for everyone, period, no matter of what your job employment status is. Thank you, Jim. Neil? Yes, Dick. My name is O'Neill Jacobs. I talked to a lot of people about health care, and uh, a lot of people seem to be very satisfied. They don't realize that, according to all the studies being done across the country, that within the next five to eight years, we'll be having uh, bills of, a, of about fifteen to $18,000 for health care for a family of four. That is obscene. This is a moral issue. Health care is a moral issue. We are our brothers and our sisters' keeper. And from what I've studied, the single-payer system is the way that will provide that care. Right. Thank you. Tell us about being our brothers, sisters, keepers, Margarita. Well, uh, being, uh, my name is Margarita Romo, and being a farm worker representative, one of the things that we have seen is that farm workers are the most uh, marginal population in this country, and we need a single-payer system. For all of us. Yes. Nell, 
Well, I'm Nell Kennedy, and I'm in favor of the single-payer system because I want to be able to choose my own doctor and drop them if I want to. And I want my doctor to make decisions about my health care, not the insurance company. We all say amen to that. We're going to conclude with Eileen Jacobs. And Eileen, wrap this up for us. Dick, I'm Eileen Jacobs. I'm an educator and a parent and a grandparent. And as I observe what's happening in our country, I'm appalled to think that we are rationing care now. We are rationing it by health and by wealth. And we want people to join us, to become a part of this move. We can make a difference. Come and be a part of You Can and the Florida Health Care Campaign. One system for all of us. Thank you. Many of us in this room have traveled from Little Rock to Washington, and we need your help. So when you see the number at the conclusion of this program, please join us for a single-payer system, won't you? Thanks. The time to change is now. You can do it. You can transform an uneven, unequal, and costly system of health care into one that's fair and affordable and continues to provide the highest quality of medical care to all Americans. Join the fight for the single-payer system and for your health care peace of mind. The toll-free number for more information is 1-800-634-4442 or you can write to you can. 1800 Euclid Avenue, Box 318, Cleveland, Ohio, 44115. Call or write. Do it today. Watching alternative views, information and perspectives which the regular media won't show you. Here are some more news stories. We have some stories about some of the bad things that are happening to milk and milk cows and beef and all, particularly related to some of the BGH or the growth hormones, which have been approved by the federal, uh, by the Food and Drug Administration. Now, what BGH is, is a synthetic hormone that is injected into cows, and it does have the potential to increase their milk by as much as 20%. But BGH does put an increased stress on a cow's system. It also leads to increased incidences of utter infections. It should be noted that this BGH is banned in Europe, at least until the year 2000. So those folks over there know it's banned. Yeah, there have been several experiments, and, and we know that it's bad, but the FDA continually seems to deny the effects of, of, of the BGH, especially once it goes through the cow and into the human chain, human food chain, uh, the results can be disastrous. I understand that it isn't so much a, that the worst thing is, is not the BGH itself, but the fact that the cow develops uh, udder infections, and so as a result, they've got to give the cows um, some medicine, some antibiotics, in order to counteract this. Now, traces of these antibiotics do show up in the milk, but since animal antibiotics are poorly regulated, there is absolutely no way of knowing what ingredients of the antibiotic soup are ending up in the milk that we drink and that we purchase off the counter. Um, 
We also know that this disease-causing organism can develop resistance to antibiotics. And then you have a kind of a related story from uh, another uh, magazine that uh, shows a problem with this uh, uh, BGH, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's not exactly the um, same thing, but what it relates to is that these dairy cattle when they are given this bovine growth hormone, it causes them to eat more feed concentrate. And the problem that's developed from this is there's a disease known as bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is a deadly nervous system disorder um, that is, is gotten from eating these feed concentrates that now the dairy cattle have to eat more because of this growth hormone. But in the recent discovery of mad cow disease on a ranch in Alberta, Canada, has fueled concern that this disease epidemic in British cattle may have established a foothold in North America, posing a danger both to the cattle industry and potentially to public health. Um, according to In These Times from January, February, issued by Joel Bly Blyfus, he reports um, on this disease and how it's being contracted by the, the cattle in British colony. Since 1986, 100,000 cattle in Britain have contracted what is known as mad cow disease. Um, it is thought that British cattle contracted the virus-like agent that causes this, this degenerative brain disease um, by eating protein feed supplements made from the rendered carcasses of sheep that were infected with sc scrapie, which is the sheep form of transmissible uh, BSE. So far, two British dairy farmers whose herds were infected with BSE have died from Creutzfeldt Jacob disease, CJD, which is a rare human transmissible uh, encephalopathy with an incubation period of up to 30 years. Now, is this the same type of thing which uh, back in the 50s and all they called uh, uh, uh hoof and mouth disease and they had to slaughter hundreds of thousands of uh, cattle? Is this the same type of I thing? I think they're, they're, what they're saying is it's related, it's very similar to the hoof and mouth disease. Um, they have to go through the same process of, of slaughtering the cows and so it won't be spread uh, throughout the population of people that are eating the cattle. Um, since 1990, or 1989, the number of Britons who succumb to the CJD each year has increased 100%. Um, this virus cannot be identified, and therefore there is no treatment and no vaccination, so we cannot stop its spread through blood transfusions or transplants. But uh, now the official position of the British and U.S. government is that BSE uh, poses no risk to humans. <laughs> yeah. But as the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agriculture's USDA BSE fact sheet puts it, to date, no scientific evidence indicates that BSE is a human health hazard. Of course, to date, no scientific experimentations have been done on humans to find out if this is so. But in the laboratory, the human, cow, sheep, and mink form of the disease have been clinically transmitted to a variety of other mammals, including rodents, chimpanzees, monkeys, felines, and pigs. There is no reason to believe that humans are not similarly susceptible. There are other problems with this uh, growth hormone and all like that, is that uh, according to the Z Magazine article, uh, they quoted a BGH boycott director who's saying that BGH is a disaster for cows, human health, the environment, and the small dairy farmers. Now that BGH has been approved by the FDA, there is particular concern about the possible illnesses the IGF-1 in the milk can pose to pregnant women, unborn babies, and nursing infants. If BGH is allowed to skate through, that it paves the way for several hundred more biotech frankenfoods, they call it, uh, which are waiting in the wings for FDA approval because this is one of those genetically engineered things. But it also means that if farmers, consumers, and uh, uh, students don't work together that there's to get this, there's going to be a market glut of milk and dairy products because of this increased production. This will drive down the prices, but you may say, well, that's good. We'll have lower prices. But if there's a big uh, uh, subsidy, price guarantee, price support for the dairy industry, so if their profits and prices go down, that means the government's going to step in and give them money.
According to Fred Weir, in an October 18th story in the In These Times, the flames that you saw engulfing the Russian parliament building may also have destroyed Russia's four-year experiment with democracy. And according to Weir, Ru Russia is reverting to a police state. Opposition newspapers, parties, and movements have been banned. Not only has the local parliament been shut down, but many local councils are being closed down by armed troops. Oppositional newspapers are shut down, and oppositional leaders have been arrested. For instance, Boris Kagalitsky, who's a leader of the Democratic Labor opposition, who's probably the most well-known Russian intellectual in the West. He's published several books on Russian history in the last few years. He's lectured all over the United States and England and Europe. He's very well known as a moderate, rational intellectual. He was arrested and was beaten by the police thugs that are supporting Yeltsin, and they tried to get him to confess that he was one of the leaders of drunken thugs and hooligans who were trying to cause chaos and lead Russia into anarchy. Well, anyone that knows the highly intellectual Kagerlitsky knows that this is total uh, nonsense. So it seems that Yeltsin is really coming down and repressing the, heart, the opposition of all sorts to his regime. None of this, according to Wire, was inevitable. The, both the Russian parliament and the Yeltsin administration both were calling for elections so they could have easily negotiated some sort of compromise on this. They could have easily tried to settle this by democratic means. According to the story in Weir, the people that were occupying the White House were not diehard communists, as the Western media indicated, but were members of parliament who had been Yeltsin supporters previously, the folks who had stood side by side with him in the White House protesting the attempt of the communist takeover a couple years before where Yeltsin emerged as the hero of the democracy movement. But over the next couple of years, he alienated himself from all his former allies and was simply refusing to work with them, to negotiate with them, to operate with them in a democratic way. Well, predictably, the media in the United States took Yeltsin's side, as did, of course, the Clinton administration. On September the 22nd, the first day of reporting of the crisis, the New York Times' Serge uh, Shehaman described the Russian parliament as a communist dominated legislature that had been elected in 1989. This is simply false, according to a critic in, in these times. That one, these weren't communist hardliners that were dominating the parliament, but a variety of different individuals from different factions who had been Yeltsin's former allies. Moreover, they were ones that were elected in the only free election that Russia ever has had this century, which was a 1990 election and not the 1989 election that the New York Times uh, reported. The New York Times also whitewashed all of Yeltsin's shutting down of the organs and instruments of democracy, his repression of his opponents, and basically characterized the uh, demonstrators as hardline communists and nationalists day after day. One October the 5th news report, for instance, described Yeltsin's routed foes as a motley collection of communists, ultranationalists, fascist bully boys, and anti-Semites who cluster around the parliament's um, cause, all of which is highly uh, misleading. So once again, as Chomsky and Herman argued, the mainstream media, particularly the New York Times, follows the line of U.S. foreign policy. U.S. foreign policy was supportive of Yeltsin in this case, with Clinton and others in the U.S. coming to his support. So the mainstream media simply followed through, and there's been very little critical discourse of Yeltsin, who has shown himself to be a thoroughly authoritarian and hardly a democratic leader. Another guy saw a, a speech which will show in its entirety uh, on uh, alternative views uh, sometime. 
and which fellow was giving some background on how the United States had been working to destabilize and hence overthrow the Soviet Union and its system, starting with the, uh, well, it didn't start, but it accelerated with Gorbachev opening up the uh, country and liberalizing uh, the laws and all. The uh, U.S. Uh, quasi-intelligence organizations, uh, like the National Endowment for Democracy and all, they flooded into the Soviet Union. They set up newspapers all over the country. They set up radio stations all over the country so that they could uh, flood the country with the uh, with U.S. propaganda. And now this is in the hands of Yeltsin. So it's no wonder that uh, Yeltsin, the, the United States wants Yeltsin to uh, uh, have elections because they'll be able to have complete uh, control over the mass media and it'll be fairly easy for Yeltsin to emerge victorious. Frank, in point of fact, Yeltsin totally controls the media in the Soviet Union. He has tighter control over the media or as tight control as the Communist Party did in the heyday of Stalin and Brezhnev and the other Soviet leaders. The opposition is sometimes allowed to state its views but it's framed by negative comments by the commentators who are all Yeltsin's people. All the opposition newspapers are shut down, so basically the Soviet citizens are getting Yeltsin's point of view. Isn't it incredible how the mass media <laughs> handle this? They call the people who were in the White House, the elected uh, governments, the elected uh, parliament, they call them, they were the leaders of a coup, they call them the people who tried to, who made it, tried an unsuccessful coup. And as you say, there were all hardliners and communists. I mean, God and fascists my. and anti-Semites and other motley uh, crew, et cetera. When it was in fact an illegal crew by, uh, coup by Yeltsin. Right. God. There's one exception in the mainstream media in the U.S who gave very good analysis, and that's Stephen Cohen of Princeton University, who's probably one of the top Soviet scholars in the United States. He's had a few sensible things on CBS News, but they only gave him a minute or two. But I saw him on a late night PBS talk show, and it was a full hour show, and he got really angry and really attacked Yeltsin and said, look, there's a whole history to this. Over the last two years, Yeltsin has systematically refused to work with the parliament. These people in the parliament are his former friends and associates who he simply alienated. He's totally undemocratic. He's a drunk. He's a boor. He's authoritarian. He's just not a democratic leader. And that's the only real discourse I saw in the mainstream media that was critical of Yeltsin, but everyone else seemed to just follow Clinton's line. And since then, the issue has pretty much been dropped. You hardly see it on uh, TV, while the Russian people continue to uh, suffer. That brings us to the end of another Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We'd like to thank some of the people who helped make our program possible. Trish Busa, Itza N. Gutierrez, Shannon B. Lorito, and Manon J. Thomason. Also, Brian Lynch. He was our director, set up the lights. Eric Eubank and Kevin West also helped with the news section. The Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. That's our address in case you'd like to contact us. Goodbye.